Okay, for chapter four, I really only want to go over a couple of individuals, specifically Young and Adler, um, and talk about their relevance to personality. The rest of the material uh, should get out of the textbook. So, uh, first we'll start with Young. And Carl Jung was a disciple of Freud. They would say that uh, Jung was Freud's chosen heir, um, but there was a split, and um, they uh, broke up with one another, and Jung went on his own way, um, along with the other neo-Freudians. So Jung, uh, uh, his theories are very similar to Freud's, um, and they kind of developed their theories at the same time and then met, and then uh, Freud was kind of the dominant individual, and Jung kind of followed suit and became his student. His background's really weird. Um, he comes from a very successful family in Switzerland. Um, his family is very educated, uh, and he was educated in a number of different areas. So he was exposed to religion, philosophy, mysticism. Um, his uh, um, he even has some uh, connections to like the Freemasons. So uh, he was always a very good student, um, but he did have some weird mystical experiences. And this kind of comes into Jung's theories. Um, one um, that I like, and the, I think there's a different one in the book, but at one time, and I know this sounds bizarre, but he was sitting next to a rock and he was able to move his consciousness from himself to the rock as a child. Now, that might sound a little weird, but um, it's experiences like that that probably um, uh, are responsible for the development of some of his theories. So you'll see a lot of themes from religion and philosophy running through his works. And he's, uh, there's tons of books about Jung, and I'm not a Jungian expert, um, a lot of people are. If you're interested in this, there's a lot more resources. So the mind has a psyche, or the mind is your psyche, and it has three parts. The ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious. And here, the ego is really similar to Freud's ego. So this is a conscious part of your personality. And this is your sense of self, who you are. Now the personal unconscious is a little different. And this has thoughts that are not part of conscious awareness. So it's kind of like the unconscious, right? But here, um, this is personal to us. And not only does it have the threatening material, um, like Freud's conceptualization of the unconscious, um, like threatening and uh, unacceptable material, um, but it contains all non-conscious material. And here, he says not only past, but future material. And then the third area, which is probably the most important defining characteristic of Jung, is the collective unconscious. And this is a deeper level of the unconscious. And this is a shared unconsciousness with the rest of humanity. So there's things that come down through humanity that we all have a shared consciousness with one another. And here is where you'll find those archetypes that we've gone over, or the universal emotional symbols. So the archetypes, these are just some of them, there's lots of them, and I ask you to identify them in film, they're in movies, they're in mythology, the archetypes can be seen all over the place. Um, so we have the anima or the animus, and the, the, this is male elements in a woman, the animus or female elements in a man, the anima, the persona in the shadow. The persona is a socially acceptable side of your personality, like you put on your persona, versus the shadow, which is the dark and unacceptable side of your personality. The mother um, archetype is the embodiment of generativity and fertility, and then the hero and the demon. And this is strong forces for good versus cruelty and evil. Jung was the first one to kind of come up with this idea of complexes, and a complex is a group of emotional charged thoughts that are related to a particular theme. Um, so you'll hear people say, oh, you have a father complex or a daddy complex. Um, Jung kind of came up with this idea, and he developed a word association test 
to identify complexes that an individual might have. So um, you've heard this before, like, okay, I'll say a word and you tell me the first word that pops up in your mind. Don't think about it too much, just tell me the word. And so if I went car, ball, chair, whatever those words are that pop up in your head, if you did this with Young, you would go over it and over it and over it, and he would look for patterns that would be indicative of complexes. Now, Young said that the mind has four functions, and this is a little confusing. Um, what I want you to do, if you get stuck on this, go to the book. But the four functions of the mind are sensing, thinking, feeling, and intuition. Okay? Now, he divides those into two groups, irrational and rational functions. So, this is where it's a little confusing. I don't really care about the distinction between these. It doesn't really matter to me um, whether it's rational or irrational. I just want you to know that there's four functions of the mind. So sensing is like knowing is there something there, like sensing something. Intuition is, um, it involves thought, but it's like where did it come from and where is it going? So like you're using your intuition to make predictions about what might happen. Rational, um, under the category of rational here, we have the function of thinking. So what is it that is there? So thinking about a situation and feeling. And the example here is what is it worth? So don't worry about like the examples here. Just know that we use our, our mind to sense things, to have intuition, to feel things, and to think about things. So we have those four functions. Now, there's two major attitudes of the mind. So we've got the four functions times the two attitudes. And the two attitudes, and Young was the first one to introduce these, and you'll hear me talk about these two attitudes over and over and over and over again in this class. And that's introversion versus extroversion. So somebody that's extroverted, uh, according to Jung, you have psychic energy within you. And somebody that is, uh, like think about like chi. Have you ever heard of that? Like somebody has chi or energy in them. Somebody that's extroverted takes that energy and they channel it out. Um, they channel it towards things in the external world. So they're extroverted. They interact with the external world. Somebody that's introverted directs their psychic energy inwards and doesn't interact with the exterior world. So they become, well, introverted and they don't like interactions with other people. So this contribution, uh, the distinction between introversion and extroversion is one of the major contributions of Jung. And what he did was he developed a typology. So this is uh, determined by the person's dominant function, like what they use, either sensing, feeling, thinking, or intuition, and then extroversion or introversion. So we take the four functions and times them by the two attitudes, and we get eight types, or the eight typologies. And you may, in fact, have actually taken a test called the Myers-Briggs Personality Indicator. So you will fit to one of these, um, and that will be your dominant type. So you might be uh, sensing uh, extroverted. And it really has formed the basis of this Meyer Briggs uh, type indicator, which is in the past one of the most frequently used measures of personality, not so much anymore. But again, his background was in Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. He read the I Ching, he was influenced by astrology, spiritualism, Gnosticism, alchemy, dream interpretation, mandala symbolisms, theosophy, and Greek mythology. And you see all these areas kind of converge into Jung's theories. So this is just a very, very brief introduction. If you're interested in his work, go check it out somewhere else.